Hi everyone, welcome to Facebook Live. November is National Epilepsy Awareness Month, and here to give us all the details is Dr. Anu Singh. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's an honor to be here, Lana. She's a neurologist here at Mount Sinai, and she's also an expert in epilepsy. And the first question I want to ask you is, what is epilepsy? So epilepsy is a disease where you have more than two recurrent unprovoked events that about 24 hours apart. And what are the symptoms of this? So symptoms can be really vary from patients to patients. There are, uh, there are some subtle kind of seizures where you just have brief staring or behavioral arrest and then the other end of the spectrum is a grand mal seizure which is also called a tonic-clonic seizures where you have stiffening of the body, you have convulsions, you have patients can have tongue biting, frothing from the mouth which lasts for one or two minutes and then slowly but surely they return back to their normal state. And if you're diagnosed with epilepsy, you have seizures beyond those initial two, is that correct? Right, so seizure is a, is a transient state of patient going, doing some abnormal behavior, which is as a result of excitation in the brain. Seizures can be provoked or they can be unprovoked. Some of the examples of provoked seizure is that somebody has low glucose or low calcium in their body and had a seizure, so they, they drank some alcohol or drugs and had a seizure. But if you had no provoked events which led to that seizures, then, and if you had more than two seizures, that's called epilepsy, and they have a higher chance of having a third or a fourth seizures if they are untreated, almost close to 80% chance. What can lead to this? So there are several uh, risk factors for epilepsy, and it really starts with the, uh, with the childbirth. So there are children who suffer from anoxia or lack of oxygen in the brain. They can have seizures. There are certain conditions where you're born with some metabolic defect in your body, or you have suffered from some genetic or chromosomal abnormality that predispose you to have seizures. Then as you mature, there can be seizures with high fever, especially in infants. If you have suffered from any head trauma with significant loss of consciousness, that puts you at a risk of seizures. If there is a very strong family history of seizures, um, then there is a small chance that you can transmit it to your children. And then if you have any kind of abnormality in the brain, like you know, patients develop stroke, they have some kind of benign or more malignant kind of brain tumors, or any other abnormality, like vessel abnormalities, they can have seizures. And another question that some people might have, if you've never dealt with anybody who's having a seizure before, and this is happening right in front of you, what do you do? How do you help that person? Um, so there are different kinds of seizures. There are very subtle seizures where you don't need to do much. Um, but then, as I mentioned, then there are grand mal seizures, and definitely you want to take certain precautions. Um, you want to prevent any kind of falls or injuries. Uh, you want to make sure that patients are rolled to one side very softly. You don't want to put any kind of pressure on their body because that is not good for the bones. And you want to time the seizure, how long the seizure lasted. You want to make sure that you put a soft pillow or something soft around their head so that when, as they are jerking, they do not injure their head and they're not near any glass objects where they fall or rub lose, as they lose their muscle tone. And that's all you can do. Even if you don't do anything, brain knows how to stop the seizures and probably seizure will last one or two minutes and then they should be a little confused, little disoriented and back to normal. Something you were telling me earlier is that you don't want to put anything in their mouth. Is that yes. correct? Yes, you never put anything in their mouth. Um, some people have this myth that as patients have seizures, they can swallow their tongue. The tongue is supported by several large muscles in the mouth. They can never swallow their tongue. In fact, if you put something in their mouth, they can injure their teeth and uh, can have other injuries. You had also mentioned that timing is so important. You need to time these seizures. What is the timing? When do you call 911? How long does the seizure last for you to call 911? So if, if a family is aware of their typical seizures and the duration of the seizures that they last one or two minutes, you do not need to call 911 every time they have a seizures. But there are some times when you worry about if you have a seizure lasting more than five minutes, if you have a condition that you have several seizure cluster one after another, that is the time to get worried about, um, then you call 911. If it is a pregnant patient, if it is a diabetic patient, if they have suffered from any injuries during the seizures, then you definitely want to call 911. 
So any prolonged duration, any succession of seizures, any signs of injury, you should call the ambulance. So it's critical to get help, right? Talk to us about diagnosis. So a diagnosis of seizures, um, you know, it, seizures come in different uh, variety of symptoms. They can be as subtle as people, you know, the smartest doctor may be in the room or the smartest school teacher is in the room, but they will not recognize that patient is going through seizures. And they can be confused with attention deficit disorders or they can be, you know, people say, oh, this child is always daydreaming. So those are subtle seizures. They're sometimes called absent seizures, but just for five or 10 seconds, you're losing contact with the surroundings. And then there are medium kinds where you do some certain funny movements of the hands, certain funny movements of the mouth or lip smacking movements, or you're fumbling with your, you know, bed sheets or fumbling with the objects around. Um, those are where you are a little confused, little disoriented for two or three minutes. Those usually come from the temporal lobe, epile uh, temporal lobe of the brain. And then there is the extreme, which we call the grand mal seizure, as I described before, with stiffening and convulsions. And how dangerous can those large seizures be? So it is believed that absence seizures do not cause so much of uh, cognitive deficits or memory problems, and they are they, don't, they are more benign. Uh, that being said, the child is losing contact with the surroundings and would not know what or you know may have learning problems uh, in the school. Uh, if they are not recognized or they are not treated. On the other hand, the grand mal seizures, if they are untreated, they have a highest risk of things like sudden ex unexpected death in epilepsy, which unfortunately is very rare, but also risk of uh, memory problems, behavioral problems, depression, anxiety, and other risk of physical injuries. And that's why it's so important to get help and get a diagnosis of potential epilepsy. How do you diagnose someone with epilepsy? What kind of testing do you do? Right, so first is a good neurological history that is taken by a neurologist or an epileptologist who is an expert in the field of epilepsy with special training in epilepsy. You also um, uh, take a good history and want to make sure that these events are not some other mimickers of epilepsy and are misdiagnosed as, epile misdiagnosed as epilepsy. And then you do a thorough physical examination to make sure that the neurological examination is normal. You wanna check, that, do an MRI of the brain, making sure that there are no structural reasons that we find on the MRI, like stroke, brain tumor, and other things that I just mentioned. And then we do other tests called electroencephalogram, also called EEG. So basically checking the brain rhythms and looking for, in layman's term, I will say looking for epilepsy brain waves in the, in the EEG, which can help diagnose different kinds of epilepsy syndrome. And it's very important to diagnose the right kind of epilepsy because the choices of medications are different for each kind of epilepsy. So it's a very, very thorough right. process. What kind of treatment is out there? So there are medical treatments and there are surgical treatments and then there are other treatments like a special kind of diet called ketogenic diet. Um, also there are some complementary alternative medicines, patients who have difficulty tolerating the medicine. And then there are older anti-seizure medicines and newer anti-seizure medicine. And it is believed that the newer seizure medicines are much, much well tolerated compared to the older medications. But 70% of the patients, they respond very well to the medical treatment and do not continue to have seizures. But about 20 to 30% of patients may require us going to a special epilepsy center and be evaluated for the correct diagnosis and also evaluated for whether they are surgical candidates. And by surgery, I mean that can the doctors identify a small focus which is generating their seizures and remove that focus surgically. So for the most part, treatment is effective? Yes, yes. Good to know. What do your patients say when they are diagnosed with epilepsy? I'm sure that's a scary diagnosis and they're not sure how to move forward, how they can return to their past life and do those everyday activities. What do your patients say? What are some of the main questions that they have? So acceptance to the diagnosis of epilepsy is, is can be challenging. So they have different kinds of fears. Some patient asks me, Dr. Singh, can I go on with my life? Can I finish my education? So women with epilepsy have different fears that whether they will transmit this epilepsy to their kids or not. 
they also have fears whether the drugs that they're using for epilepsy will have any effect on the newborn in the future, whether they can breastfeed their baby or not, whether they can drive and they can drop off their kids to the school or not, whether they can, will be able to continue their job. And there are some jobs like driving and uh, some other construction workers, they have real fears that what if they have a seizure, if they are up on the ladder or a truck driver who, who may lose his or her job because of seizures. Of course, some valid concerns. Right. What do you tell them? I tell them that most of the patients do extremely well after seizures and they go on with their life because I have patients who have finished their medical schools or have gone on and gone to the graduate schools or got married and had healthy children. So it just requires proper diagnosis at the right time. But if you ignore it, then of course, then it can have deleterious effects. So the key is you need to have treatment if you're diagnosed and you can thrive. Yes. and move on with your life. Absolutely. That's great to know. Some good information. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Singh. My pleasure. And we'll have so much more for you on Epilepsy Awareness Month throughout this month, so make sure to just stay tuned to Facebook Live.